begin <clears throat> by uh, welcoming everyone. My name is Beverly Muhammad, and I want to welcome you to the RI Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Monthly Conversations. And for those of you that were not at the town hall, the Diversity Inclusion Leadership Council um, got feedback from our esteemed board members and they recommended that we change our name and be uh, a name that really signifies what RI represents and that's diversity, e equity, and inclusion. Um, unlike our traditional conversations, this one again this month is especially special. Um, we have with us today our RI employees. That includes our RI executive team leaders. I see some of you here online, um, our peer leaders, and we also have our board members. So I'm so excited um, to be here and to be part of our monthly conversations. Our uh, conversation will be guided by our esteemed guests. He is from uh, the Californias for Equal Rights Foundation and the San Diego Asian American for Equality Organization. And our conversation today will be moderated by our very own Carrie Devant. But before we continue with the program, for those of you that are new and for our esteemed guests, I'd like to, first of all, just share a little information about RI International. So uh, I know Frank, you probably looked at, our, at the website, but I wanted to just share this with you and those that may not be aware. RI is a global organization with more than 50 programs and it's continuing to grow. We saw that in our town hall today. They're located throughout the United States and abroad. RI staff continuously works to strengthen their position as a worldwide leader of mental health and substance abuse crisis service design delivered delivery as well as a peer delivered care. So we they have both uh, delivery care perspectives. And RI's motto is we focus on what's strong, not what's wrong. Our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Council was formed in June 2020 under the sponsorship of our respected president and CEO, David Covington. David is not only passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but he has given unwaveringly support to the Council in all their endeavors, which have been many, and RI is just very privileged to have him as a trusted sponsor. So our mission is, as the DEILC, is as follows. We value the uniqueness of those we encounter because we realize their differences in viewpoints, culture, experiences, and beliefs are critical to an inclusive environment where we all can thrive. We demonstrate inclusive behavior through client recovery, clinical best practices, and optimization of quality and compliance that encourages freedom of voice, ability to grow, and a sense of belonging. RI, a global mental health recovery organization, will continue to enhance an inclusive environment where being you matters. So I thought I would just share that about RI to give everyone a framework of the wonderful work that RI is doing and also to remind us of how the diversity and inclusion, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership council is supporting all the wonderful work that RI is doing. So I wanted to just share uh, this housekeeping item 
here and I'll ask that if you are not on mute, please go on mute, except for our esteemed guest and our facilitator, which is Carrie DeVault. Um, there'll be time at the end of our presentation for Q&A. You can post your questions in the chat room and both Carrie and I will um, do our very best to answer or present them uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Sue. And uh, so without further delay, Carrie Devon uh, will, will introduce our esteemed guests. Carrie. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Um, I would like very much to uh, welcome Frank Shu. Uh, we've been looking forward to hearing him speak. Uh, we've had the privilege of meeting him a few days ago. Um, Frank Shu is president of Californians for Equal Rights Foundation, a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting and raising public awareness in the, on the principles of equality and merit. Frank is also a social activist and one of the co-founders of San Diego Asian Americans for Equality. He served as a statewide finance chair for the no, the no on 16 campaign in California, and he has committed his time and effort to the community since late 2013. After organizing several rallies against discrimination towards the Chinese community, he realized that the only way to empower the community is to serve and get involved. So he's been a board member of the Educational Technology Advisory Committee and Budget Review Advisory Committee um, in the school district near him. And he has also served as an alternate board member of the County of San Diego Health and Advisory Board. Um, I was listening to the chat earlier on before we started all this, and there are a couple of people who have actually recognized him, who have seen him on television already, and are looking forward to the conversation at the end of it. So with that in mind, it is my privilege to introduce Frank Xu. And Frank, please take it away, and, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed and Carrie, for uh, having me here. And it's my uh, privilege, privilege to be able to speak here. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining today's meeting. And you have already dem demonstrated your love and care to uh, this community. Appreciate. Uh, yeah, again, my name is uh, is Frank Xu. Uh, uh, Kerry has already introduced me a lot, so I just uh, uh, let's just go to the uh, yeah this uh, slide uh, a little bit. So uh, to introduce the accomplishments we have done uh, for our organization, San Diego Asian Americans for Equality, we are one of the six plaintiffs to sue San Diego Unified School District because the uh, school district gave. Muslim students preferential treatments. So after two years of lit litigation, the school district rescinded its unconstitutional anti-Islamophobia policy and offered a new policy protecting all students. And serving as a program manager, I set up a partnership between uh, San Diego Asian Americans for Equality and Solutions for Change to offer financial and academic help to the homeless families and kids. And it has been three years now. Uh, when we help those homeless families in need, we don't decide uh, if they need help by their race or skin color. And with Californians for Equal Rights Foundation, we recently filed an administrative complaint against San Diego Unified School District again because their critical race theory training to the teachers are racist and not constitutional again. So that's a brief introduction about me and let's move on to uh, today's topic. So the recent crimes against Asian American community. And I believe most of you have known uh, these incidents. Uh, so in, uh, in New York, uh, in New York, uh, a Filipino American was slashed in his face when he rode uh, the subway. And in San Francisco and Oakland, multiple Asian seniors were pushed to death with no confrontation at all. And the suspects intentionally wanted to hurt or kill the victims. And in Atlanta mass shooting, eight innocent people were killed, including six Asian Americans and two Caucasian Americans. And that, that's how protests and rallies with the uh, Stop Asian Hate movements were started. And some conclude 
those incidents uh, can attribute to racism. And, and that's partly true. And many of these incidents clearly has had the intention of hurting Asian Americans specifically. And indeed, uh, the racism against Asian Americans is not new, not new at all. So if we look back at the history, uh, more than 100 years ago in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act has already de uh, clearly demonstrated what systematic racism looks like. And please be noted that I use the term systematic racism instead of systemic racism, because I consider systematic racism the racial discrimination enforced by the law, by the government agencies. And system systemic racism is a different definition. And this Chinese Exclusion Act clearly demonstrated how bad it could be by solving social economic problems through the lens of race. And then it's followed by Asian Exclusion Act in uh, 1924. And then in uh, World War II, many Japanese Americans were put into internment, and which is another bad example of systematic racism enforced by the law and the public agencies. No matter how noble the reason could seem to be by then, because the uh, conflict between two countries, the war between two countries, and it proved to be unethical to treat people differently just because of their race and skin color. But America is a great country who can correct, correct its own wrongdoings. And the 1960s, 1960s civil rights movements uh, ended the history of systematic racism, or at least started the effort to end the history of systematic racism. While the movement was led by uh, mostly by black activists like Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, uh, some Asian American activists also joined the efforts, joined the fights. And the, uh, the limitation of Asian Americans' uh, immigration were also uh, lifted uh, during that period. And the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 14th Amendment started to pr protect all Americans from being discriminated because of our race uh, or skin color. But individual racism is not going any, you know, is not going anywhere. Uh, uh, in 1982, uh, Vincent Chang was beaten to death on the Detroit streets because the murderers believed that he was the Japanese to blame for their uh, job losses, uh, their hard economic uh, status. And those two murders ended up with no jail time. And with all the incidents we saw recently, we all know that the racism uh, by individuals will be ongoing for a long time and maybe uh, forever. And we have to admit, that, admit this fact when we discuss further on this tough topic. Um, and I believe one of the cause for these racist incidents are misunderstanding. And I would like to introduce a little bit about how the impression or profiling about Asian Americans are formed. And of course, it's only from my point of view. Uh, and first, let's look at the uh, history of Asian American population in America. As you can see, it's always in a rapid growth, except those years of uh, after Chinese Exclusion Act and uh, World War II. So most of the growth are from immigrants. So you can tell probably uh, every four of five Asian Americans you encounter in your daily life probably were not born and raised in America. So we speak different language, uh, probably share a different culture. And so that's why many Americans occasionally think Asian Americans are aliens and frequently ask a question, where are you from? And I believe that, you know, 
with a good intention. And to me, as a first generation immigrant, it makes perfect sense and does not offend me at all. I, I'll just simply reply, I'm original from China, right? But for next generations, like my son or daughter, they may feel offended and feel their identity as Americans challenging. And even, and sometimes even feel like uh, this is a racist question. So that's a different reactions from, uh, you know, from different backgrounds. So I just want to share with that. And another myth is a uh, model minority for Asian Americans. I can explain this impression from multiple pr perspectives. So first of all, the, uh, the previous chart tells us that there are always many uh, first generation immigrants just coming into uh, United States recently. And many of recent immigrants have higher education experience and working experience. So we may achieve more success in this new country as well, because our peer in China, that they got success too. Uh, for example, the Eric Yuan, uh, the CEO of, of Zoom, uh, is the first generation Chinese American. And on the other hand, uh, even though some earlier immigrants started from bottom, uh, our culture made them emphasize a lot on the education of, the, of our next generations. So, so you can see from the picture that uh, many Chinese uh, restaurants, the kids are helping their parents during the rush hours and, and doing their homework when the business not, is not that busy. And we have the culture to value education and hard working. So many of these next generations move upward uh, in the social ladder. The New York Times made an investigational report in 2019 about this topic and claimed that uh, you may see less Chinese restaurants business decades later. So uh, uh, if you have a chance to go to a restaurant, just <clears throat> be hurry. And uh, regarding today's uh, presentation, uh, if my friends hear about my presentation, do you, do you think they will say, good job? Or they will say, hey, do you got to practice your public speech? And that's the, the latter one. Most people, including my, you know, uh, my parents, my wife, my, my kids, they will say, you need to improve your pronunciation. Your accent is too bad. So that's the, uh, that's the culture. So make us uh, look like a model minority. Next slide, please. And another is the silent, silent minority. And uh, it also relates to uh, part to the, uh, uh, the, the population growth of the Asian Americans, because it takes us to uh, time to survive. It takes me like eight years uh, from entering the States and to get my, uh, to get my green card. And during the eight years, I, I really cannot uh, care uh, much about everything else. And it takes time to learn what's around, or what's surrounding me, and takes, takes time to understand, and even takes time and guts to express our ideas when we do have an idea. And another contributor fact, contributing factor is the memory of dictatorship from uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so that makes us look like a, si a silent uh, minority. So uh, regarding the CCP, uh, last year when I uh, served in the uh, No on 16 campaign, there's a direct attack against me. Uh, so it says, if America is a racist country, you, you wouldn't have the opportunity to be here and uh, just go somewhere to find somewhere suitable for you. Now, it looks like, well, it's just equal to go back to China, to me, right? But my reaction, reaction is, okay, I have experienced so much uh, in, back in China and I agree with you that 
America is not a racist country. So that's fine. Uh, well, that's my reaction, but for next generation, uh, they may think, you racist, how, how dare you, uh, you know, ask me to go back to China? I'm, I'm, I'm not even from China. So those are different reactions. And, and also I hope I explain well about the, uh, these impressions on, uh, on Asian Americans as well. Uh, next slide, please. I also would like to uh, uh, explain a little bit about the political structure uh, back in China. It's my experience. So it's basically a dictatorship or austerior, austerior, uh, austerian uh, structure. So one party controls everything. And so think about the leader of the CCP, even in the city, it, it controls the HR, controls the media, controls the mayor, uh, judge, police, DA, and school, everything. So if you have any dispute, uh, but anyway, so this is a structure uh, I will I mention uh, a lot. Uh, next slide, please. So with that structure, there is no due process at all. So the people there was obviously oppressed. And in the middle of this picture, uh, this guy is Liu Shaoqi, who was the chairman of China. And because, because Mao Zedong doesn't like him, didn't like him, and Mao Zedong started the Cultural Revolution, and he was beaten to death by the mobs. And he tried to protect, protect him by handing a book, which is the uh, Chinese constitution, right, that he didn't have. And even him, you know, with power can be in a very miserable situation. And for ordinary people, you know, their properties can be easily forced, torn down, even in 2019, 2020, 2021. It's happening every year. So when I came here and I was surprised, I tell you, I was surprised what I have the right to dispute a ticket from a police officer here. Because back in China, you don't. The only option is to pay the bill or bargain the amount. Can I pay 100 instead of 200? That's the only option. Next slide, please. And uh, there is no equal treatment at all. So think about uh, a son of a major or a CCP leader compete with a son of an ordinary person. It's completely different. They, uh, the, the closer a, a person is close to the CCP uh, structure, they can gain power, they have every resources they want, and they can oppress the others using the tools. Police, police officers, you know, uh, judges, DAs, so when I came into here, it's amazing that I know that California's constitution says the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin, even national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting. And so that's how uh, my, uh, my opinions were shaped from the different, uh, uh, different experiences. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the media were con completely controlled by one party back in China. And I experienced uh, how they lied when I was seven years old. Because when I was seven years old, I went to college. No, 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 I'm sorry. I went to the middle school. So, uh, so I was reported by the local media. And when I look at their reports, 
I said, it was not me. I, I could not play any instruments, but they said, okay, this, this boy is amazing. He could play this, he could play that. So, and, and it's more than that. For propaganda, it's more than that. So you cannot speak anything uh, bad about Xi Jinping or any, anything else. And, and it worried me, next slide please, when the America and media starting to behave like a propaganda. So I have one uh, reference here. So this is the, the recent, uh, recent uh, report they did uh, about San Diego. They said, uh, they said uh, San Diego pays women workers of color significantly less than white men study shows. And I was shocked by, by this title. What? We San Diego's we San Diegans are that bad? But if you look into this, uh, this article, it actually says that the, uh, uh, the study blames factors other than discrimination for gaps. So, uh, and the title makes me really uh, uncomfortable and, and believe San Diego Union Tribune right now is a propaganda machine. And look at their, their columns, they don't represent uh, diversity of ideas. Uh, that worries me a lot. So next, next slide, please. So because of the experiences uh, I had in China uh, and in the United States, I, I asked my questions, myself questions. So why were there so many wars and genocides between different racist countries in Chinese history? For 2000 years, whenever there was an there were a war. The losers will lose their properties, their life, and even their parents, grandparents' life, their, their kids. But, but here, the losers of civil war could still live with dignity. And I, 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 I heard some explanation that it's because America is a racist country, so they still uh, take care of these uh, racists. But I may have a different uh, opinion. I, it's because of the love, because of the forgiveness. And so we have the ability to reconcile with people with different opinions and sometimes even uh, had wars. And another question for myself is, within the noble winners, why are there some Chinese Americans I'm not, I'm not saying it's a lot, but at least a handful of Chinese Americans, but only one Chinese. So they are of the same race, but it's just the system, the culture is different. And another question to myself is, the Chinese Communist Party knows the Chinese history well and how they failed to deal with uh, the racial uh, relationship in the country. And they know the importance of the propaganda. And, and I'm pretty sure you, you probably know that CCP, how CCP got the, uh, got the authority to govern this country because of, they, because of their propaganda. And will they use this as a weapon to stir up America? And there is a report um, and, and those two uh, guys who had who has ties to Chinese state media actually was uh, were in a debate with me, and they just came into the United States as an uh, with the uh, as the F one st student. And they were sent by the state uh, media uh, CCTV. Uh, next slide, please. So, and then after the uh, Atlant At Atlanta shooting, I, I came across this letter. Uh, this letter was from uh, 1991, when Lu Gang, who, is a, who was a Chinese student, he killed uh, four, uh, four professors in his school. Uh, it's also a mass shooting. 
And one of the professor's family wrote a, wrote a letter to Lu Gang's family. Lu Gang was the uh, murderer. And they just said, and they ex expressed their love and forgiveness. And this letter touched me a lot. And this is the cultural I really, uh, I really like. And, and they expressed people are created equally regardless of race or ethnicity. I cannot see any racism uh, from this letter. And the only thing that can explain the differences of their attitude is the different system or different culture makes the differences. So that's my uh, reflection uh, of this letter. Uh, next slide, please. And I want to share you a little bit about the scary cultural revolution. So it, it lasted 10 years. And before that, there are another uh, movement and another movement. And that was pushed by one party, uh, Chinese Communist Party. And the violence was encouraged by the ideology. And people get guns and they shoot each other. And monuments, statues were torn down. And the Chinese history was distorted so to reflect their ideology. And after 10 years, the traditional culture, both traditional culture and economy was damaged badly. And if you still remember uh, the time of 1976, China is nowhere, right? And after that, after they abandoned this kind of uh, ideology, they started to, uh, to develop really quick with the help from, uh, from America. And now they are number two uh, eco economic system in, in the world. And next, the next slide, please. And so after I talk about the history, talk about the, uh, my experience from China, uh, I want to come back to the uh, recent attacks. Uh, from my point of view, the attacks are from both sides. Well, including the Chinese flu by uh, Mr. Trump in 2019 and uh, uh, by YG's uh, album, Meet the Flockers. Basically, uh, he, this is a rap song. Uh, it, he sings about how to identify a Chinese family and how to uh, break into it and, 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 and rob everything from uh, the family. And uh, the, uh, from the uh, San Francisco Unified School District board member, Allison Collins, and he even calls us a house inward because uh, because uh, we value education and has a uh, dispute uh, with her regarding the uh, uh, the 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 past uh, to be admitted into uh, the high school and we always ex experience discrimination uh, by universities on student on student admissions uh, it's a uh, the admission season will be uh, will be completed very soon, I believe, uh, May first. Uh, and many Asian students just had to work really hard, and their parents have to let them know that you know if you don't get A, then Asian minus two A's will be sin because you will not get into uh, a good university, even though you work hard work much harder than, than anybody else. And that's happening every year. And, and that's very um, uh, disturbing as well. Uh, ne next slide, please. Uh, so, so back to the, uh, uh, the hate crime. The hate crime, based on the FBI's definition, it has to be a crime first, and then with an added element of bias. So it's very subjective, not objective. And so that makes the uh, hate crime very hard to be classified. 
And so one uh, small tip is even Orlando Pulse not, nightclub shooting is not classified as a hate crime. So there's a reference here. So if you have, if you are interested, uh, you can uh, take a look at it. So next slide, please. So uh, comparing the hate crimes uh, trends uh, because of the subjective, it's better to com uh, to compare within the same agencies. Uh, so I don't take the uh, the website stop Asian uh, stop AAPI hate seriously because it started uh, March 2020 and has no comparison. Anybody can report. Uh, I don't think that data is uh, uh, is trustworthy or is comparable with others. So for San Diego, uh, this data is from the uh, county Dist district attorney's office. Uh, so we can clearly see there is an upward stick, but not a hard. Uh, so yeah, you can you can tell from the uh, from the numbers uh, for 2021. Right now, we have one of two hate crimes uh, crimes against Asian Americans. Next slide, please. And for New York, uh, which has reported a lot of uh, Asian uh, anti Asian hate crimes recently. But indeed, uh, you, can, you can tell from the data that uh, with the same uh, agency, uh, Jewish and Black communities, and also uh, male, homosexual, gay, uh, are of the uh, most ser serious attacks uh, uh, or victims that, uh, were of the uh, hate crimes in New York. But I'm not saying that uh, anti-Asian uh, hate crime is not serious, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, probably not as serious as the media want to uh, let you know. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, uh, and this, this is not new uh, for the uh, uh, robbery in 2018. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, in the FBI uh, crimes analysis, uh, so the point here I, I would like to make is uh, the crime rates are the uh, of our uh, interest, at least of my interest at this moment, because uh, as long as the crime rates are uh, going higher, the Asians are always uh, the victims. Uh, in the probably the most, if you look at the uh, this statis statistics uh, for the victims, if the victims are white or black, most of the offenders are within the same race. Uh, Hispanic about the same, and for Asians, when Asians are the victim victims, main many offenders come from. Uh, uh, from other races, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of my friends uh, who is a, stat, a stat, statistician, he explains that it's probably not because of racism. It's most likely because uh, Asians, most Asians, are shorter than uh, than many people, and looks like weaker, especially for uh, Asian seniors and women. So that makes they, they, them an easy target uh, for criminals. So that's one of the explanations. Uh, so next slide, please. So my response to this movement, so I, I would like to have due process for, for all, even for uh, the uh, offenders. And once the offenders are prosecuted, or prosecuted or uh, convicted, we should go tough on these criminals, and and we, we should we should be lo loving and forgive to all others. Right, even the criminals' families they are not they are not to to be blamed, and we we got to love them. 
not hate. And for me, I'm going to uphold the belief that people are created equal and deserve to be treated equally. And based on the current movement, I'm really, really alarmed by the anti-racism. And I can relate it to the cultural revolution in China. When the history was distorted, violence were encouraged, and uh, statues were torn down, and media were controlled. And this may destroy our system, our culture. I was extremely alarmed about that. And Stop Asian Hate, this movement is pushed by the same origin from the anti-racism uh, theologists. So that's why I have a mixed, very mixed feeling regarding the Stop Asian Hate movement. And next slide, please. So uh, one question that probably for you is, uh, what, what can you do to support Asian Americans? So from my point of view, there is no silver bullet to solve any social issues, including this one, once and for all and forever. So if you can just treat us just as Americans as much as you can uh, and treat all of us equally and individually. And that, that's so important to, to treat us individually because even though someone look like me doesn't mean that he shares the same opinion with me. I have explained a little bit about uh, next generations. They may have different reactions uh, than me, right? And even for the first generation Chinese Americans, think about that. They may be brainwashed by the Chinese media already, even though they, they, they live in the United States for, for a long time. And that's why you can see some reports about, uh, you know, the steals, uh, some, uh, uh, some proper, some knowledge and, and go back to, uh, to China and that happened. So just treat all of us equally and individually and based on our merits instead of uh, our skin color. And please be confident with American history and the current system. Even though it's not perfect, nothing man-made is perfect. And, and help us uh, educate everyone to believe in education hard and hard working and, and be cautious on any revolution or revolutionary idea and that could damage our system permanently. And, and thank you, thank you again for allowing me to share this, uh, share my, uh, my point of view with all of you. Wow, thank you, Frank. You know, uh, I listened to you and I was, I could see that dichotomy of some things are, are, bad but yet there are those things that are good and it it seems to kind of balance out your beliefs so we are now open for questions uh i would like to just start with one question uh frank um you mentioned having come to this country um, as an immigrant and having to wait your time with your uh, green card, what was your easiest transition coming from, from, from your country to America? Well, obviously the easiest transition is on my profession because I'm a software engineer and when I came from uh, China, so these are the same language, you know, C, uh, C or Java. And, yeah. and so that's the easiest transition. But I had a problem, uh, you know, uh, partying with my, uh, with my colleagues because whenever they talk about, uh, talk about uh, baseball, basketball, I had, what, 
I, I don't know these names. And it took me some time to, <laughs> to remember the names, the rules, you know, especially for baseball. Yeah. You know, I can, um, I can relate to C sharp and C plus plus and JavaScript and COBOL and assembler language, because that was part of my world in IT as well. So thanks for sharing that with me. Um, any questions for Frank? Yes, there I have been actually a few of them. Um, likewise, I'd like to thank you, Frank, for this. It was it was fascinating, and I want to take an opportunity to be a little selfish and ask my own question first too. <laughs> um, one of the things that I noticed at the very beginning is that you talked about you had a very graceful way. You showed a lot of grace, and you said that you don't. You think that maybe that racism is more about misunderstanding, which I think is a very grace filled way and gives us an opportunity to kind of maybe focus on educating rather than on hating. Um, how do you see a nation that has been recently pretty torn up with all the stuff that's been going on with the Black Lives Movement, the, the, the Asian um, the crimes that we have seen occur? How do you see a larger path towards that kind of love and forgiveness? Um, well, uh it, it is it is not easy and uh, for forgiveness and especially if you consider the cultural the, the, the background of the 3,000 years of the uh, you know of wars and fights in, in Chinese history and and that's what amazed me when I saw the letter from the professor's family. I, I believe, in, I, I was baptized back in 2008 as an, uh, you know, right now I'm a Christian and I believe the Christian value uh, helps me to understand how we can get the love and the forgiveness from. That's again, uh, just my humble opinion. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, one of the questions that we had here is, which country, if any, do you believe has had a good inclusion diversity policy or a good role model for others? Well, I, I have expressed very clearly that <laughs> this country is great. <laughs> you know, even though I see so many unfairness, yes, absolutely. But if you experienced if you saw what I saw in China, it, it, it wasn't, it's much, much better here in the United States. Obviously, and of course we have, we, we still have rooms to, to improve, no doubt. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, I saw Ben's hand go up. Oh yeah. Hi, Van. Good to Hi. see you. Yeah, I, I was also wondering, um, Frank, is, you know, uh, a lot of times education for a large segment of the population, you start seeing be reflected in movies and in commercials. So when I was growing up in the 50s, uh, most commercials and movies were just white people. And, you know, in the last few years, I've been seeing a lot more diversion and inclusivity in commercials and, and, uh, and even in movies. Uh, so my question is, what's your perception of this? And do you think this is going to be a a big help in, 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 in educating the public that, you know, we, we're, you know, we're uh, mostly ethnic, you know, uh, that we are, you know, really all, all parts of the world. Yeah, I, I absolutely. You know, uh, when I first engaged into local politics, uh, I went to the meetings of Power Unified School District. And I noticed that uh, for each flyer they had, there is no face of 
uh, Asian Americans. And then I, I realized that, you know, this, uh, you know, with more faces could create uh, the feeling of inclusion. But in the same, in the meantime, I, reali I also realized that sometimes it takes time. Uh, say, for example, uh, there is no first generation Chinese uh, assembly member in California right now. Is that a discrimination? Or should we have one to inspire us to be a politician? I, I, I would say probably not. Just, just naturally that people grow and uh, you know, eventually uh, someday uh, some qualified person will be there. And that's my, uh, my personal. It takes time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Um, I do see another hand up. There's another question in the chat too that I don't want to miss, but I do see Dario has his hand up. And you're on mute, Dario. We can't hear you. And Jeff's hand. I do, I do that all the time on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted I just wanted to like to thank you for like uh for like uh being so inclusive in your in your in your presentation because um I think like a lot of times in the conversation you know like like someone said you know on the black white spectrum um you know uh in the shuffle everything gets lost because um I think you mentioned on Club Pulse you know like um how that wasn't classified as as a hate crime and um you know like I, I have a friend who was like uh, beat up and left in the snow to die and um and the guy's got two years you know um and and you mentioned you know that that an Asian person like got, got beat up and I think they, they, they didn't get, they didn't get any time. Right. And, um, you know, um, you know, and I think someone said, I, I can't, I can't remember the star's name. I think he started in Kiki Boots, but you know, uh, on the black, you know, all black lives matter, like, um, movement, like he said, you know, I, you know, I, I hope you mean all black lives matter because, you know, like, I know some of you are saying it and, you know, like, you don't mean like gay black lives and you don't mean trans black lives. So I hope that you, that you're really, so I, I really appreciate that you, you were inclusive on that end because um and now now that asian lives are like um or you know are being in in, in interjected in the in the conversation and and your whole presentation did include that you know even and you know aligning with your spiritual beliefs because i believe i believe like you believe you know um and um and uh you know and i i think uh that inclusivity kind of like just uh just kind of just you saying that just kind of really solidified your uh your uh your um i don't know how to say it but um your credibility you know and your inclusive inclusivity so thank you i really appreciate that so thanks um i see you waving jeff um go ahead jeff yeah, has a question uh, for you. First, yeah thank you first frank i wanted to say thank you for coming i thought that was very a very good presentation but i was wondering if you could compare China's politics to American politics, because it seems like I was very worried in 2020 that the previous administration was going to get back in and we'd see perpetuation of the hate and racism that we saw in the previous four years. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what would have happened possibly if that administration would have won again. We would have four more years of that kind of political hate and racism, using terms like Chinese flu and, and stuff like that. So I was wondering if you could make that uh, analysis, please. Sure, absolutely. If the previous administration were in the Chinese system, it could do much more damage. For example, when that, whenever he issued the, uh, uh, the Muslim immigration, uh, what, what, what's that called? The, uh, the, he signed an ex, ex, exclusive yeah, the, yeah, the, order yeah. to exclusion eight, right. eight, eight Muslim countries. There will, there will be no court there to say no. Mm -hmm. No. And if he says, uh, but, but, so the major difference is, is Americans here respect the laws, respect the court, the court decisions. Right. And in China, anyone has the power, he is the court. 
he can control the court and uh, his decision will be final and you have no way to dispute and so you have no way to uh, achieve any justice. So that's my point of view. So, okay. so they may have, you know, for in China, they may have very uh, good uh, efficiency. Uh, as President Obama said, uh, when they wanted to have a railway, they have it the next year because they can forcibly torn down anyone's building. But in America, I'm so grateful that no one has this power and everyone has to behave under the law. And that's what I'm grateful for. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. I'm just scrolling to find that question that was in the chat box. I don't see any other hands at the moment. Um, what are the ways in which anti-racism might be harmful to an individual in our society? That one came so, from anti-racism. I have to bring up a, um, a name, Dr. Ibram Kendi, and he, she uh, he wrote an, a book. It's a New York Times bestseller, how to become an anti-racist. And in that book, he defined that there is a good racial discrimination and there is a bad racial discrimination. And I was worried about that because the good racial discrimination is also discrimination. And it, if his idea was, is in, was enforced by this country, we will experience uh, unfairness from every level of society. And that will cause more unrest than uh, so-called equity. And we have already experienced that uh, as I, uh, in my, uh, presentation, and 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 for all the symptoms, I I demonstrated in the slide Chinese Cultural Revolution. Uh, you can see some of them in America now. Our histories are distorted now, and our statues, even school names, are renamed. Uh, well, un under the name of fighting racism. I find, um, thank you for uh, bringing that, that uh, idea up of the good racism versus bad racism. I agree with you on that. So it does actually help me understand um, why you made that comment about um, being careful about anti-racism, because it sounds like it's, it's um, maybe a call to make sure we're educating ourselves pro appropriately about whose voice is speaking and where their backgrounds are. A am I correct in, in kind of summing it up that way? Uh, excuse me, can you, can you repeat? Um, that I, I kind of basically heard with what you answered with was that it's more of a call to educate ourselves to make sure that we are aware of what voice is speaking and, and making sure that it's an accurate voice versus someone who might say, hey, there's actually some good racism, um, which we just don't agree with at all. Yeah. So, yes. Okay. Um, ben, does that answer your question? Um, Bryn, Benjamin Bryn? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, it brings up, brings up um, more, more questions, but that definitely, definitely answered my question for sure. For sure. The, the, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Not very good. Thanks so much. Does anybody else have any questions? We're, we're getting close to that time. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to at least ask. I don't see any hands raised and don't see anything else in the chat box. I see Ben's hand is raised. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, it's not so much a question. It's just a final comment I share very briefly. When uh, at Appomattox, at the end of the Civil War, when uh, Robert E. Lee was being introduced to General Grant's staff, uh, he noticed Ely Parker uh, 
uh, on General Grant's staff and as a full-blooded Seneca Indian. And Robert E. Lee said to him, well, it's good to see a lot, at least one true American here. And E. Lee Parker replied, we are all Americans. Yes, we are all Americans. Thank wow. you. Again. Thank you. So Frank, I just wanted to share our sincere appreciation for your insightful presentation, your humility. You really uh, provoked a lot of thought. Uh, you caused us to pause and think uh, and reflect on your presentation. I learned a, a great deal about you, about your perspective, and historically information about China. And now I have a frame of reference now. And I can see how we in America, we get accustomed to our way and everything is relative, but coming from a different place, uh, you could see the differences and that can shape an individual's perspective. So I, I sincerely appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I wanted to just ask you, um, in what ways, I know you're president of the Californians for Equal Rights Foundation, and you're also a co-founder of the San Diego Asian Americans for Equality. Is there anything that we can do in terms of going to your website? Uh, do you guys have brochures? Do you have shirts? Do you have um, anything that you would like RI to um, uh, check out at your website? And if so, you can put that in the chat room. Yes, I just put the, uh, uh, the Californians for Equal Rights Foundation uh, uh, at the website in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. And Carrie, I see Mercedes' hands. Is, her hand is up. Mercedes, yes. did you have some yes. time to go for a question? Yes, not, not a question, just a comment. I'm a foreign person also, like Fran stated. This is a magnificent country where peace, liberty, freedom abounds, regardless of all the things that we have seen. What wrong comes out in the front, but what right usually stays behind. Being is, the country is one of the best things ever happened to anybody being able to live in this freedom and liberty. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Mercedes. I absolutely agree. This is one of the greatest countries in the world. Um, but like what I was hearing earlier, I shouldn't say but like, and like what I was hearing earlier, um, there's always room for growth. And I'm very appreciative of these opportunities that we get to talk to people who um, help us do that growth and help us to see where we need to go and where we can be even greater and even better. Because I think there's scope for that. And uh, I think that we have enough people who want that to occur. So. And I think those people are right here. Yes. Right here in this forum. I think all of you have demonstrated your support for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And some of you, I've just, just by your presence every month, I've grown to know you, I've grown to hear your insights and your life experiences. And having esteemed people like Frank come and present is educational and it just shows that uh, both David, Cigna, and all of um, Lisa St. George and the board members and Karen and the DEILC members, how supportive they are of you employees and the work that you're doing for RI. So I can't say enough for how much the support means. And I just want to give a shout out. And why don't we all clap for Frank? Frank, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here and taking time out of your busy schedule to support RI.
and we hope to have you come back again. Thank yes, you. Please Thank you for having me. Feel free to keep in contact with us. <laughs> okay, Thank everyone. Uh, Karen will be sending out a survey directly after this call. Please take a moment and share your thoughts. Uh, it means so much to the DEILC uh, console because they can take that feedback and make these sessions even better. So great job, everyone. Frank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank one. you, Carrie. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad and Carrie. Great job. Yeah, You're thank welcome. you, Karen. Thank you. And Antonio, thank you for referring Frank. Great yes. job. Bye. Bye, guys.